nonprofit social enterprise dedicated to keeping all your information safe. Uh, and together with Anne Nguyen, we're going to be talking about Cybersecurity 101, um, how to make sure you protect the information inside your organisation, because often not-for-profits have really sensitive data and making sure that we keep our clients' trust and keep that safe is really important um, for us and for our clients. We might jump to the next slide, Anne, because I wanted to talk through the fact that um, I'm speaking to you from um, Wurundjeri land in the Kulin Nation, as is Anne today. Uh, we both pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, particularly want to acknowledge anyone on the call today um, who is Aboriginal or Indigenous um, and, and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, and, and it's really good to see these conversations progressing, albeit with some challenges like the Nationals position on The Voice, but hopefully we'll work through that in a positive way over the next year or two. From an agenda perspective, I wanted to cover four key things. Uh, one, cybersecurity threats. I'm sure you're all familiar with Optus and Medibank. Unfortunately, I was picked up in the Optus data breach, not Medibank at least, but certainly others in my team were. Um, I want to talk about the top five things that you should know to keep your organization's data safe. Some additional resources to extend your knowledge because we can't cover everything everyone wants to understand uh, in a 25, 30 minute webinar. And we do also have time for your questions. So please don't hesitate um, to jot them down at any stage and then uh, pop in throughout or uh, wait till the end when we should have five, maybe even 10, we'll see how we go, minutes for questions. Um, as you join, you will have been muted. Please keep your uh, microphone on mute unless you want to jump in and ask a question about something on the screen. Um, if you can keep your video on, it's always nice for us to see some smiling faces, excited to talk cybersecurity, um, but also understand if you want to munch away at lunch and, and keep that off. Please raise your hand virtually in the chat or um, physically if you've got your video on um, and the webinar is being recorded. So we will share that within two days together with a copy of the presentation. So you will get all of that together. Um, security in the headlines. This is, I, I'm going to say, unfortunately, this is getting worse um, from the perspective of there is more breaches happening than there was six to 12 months ago. Um, good news is organisations are starting to take cybersecurity more seriously. Um, challenging news is hackers are also more interested in trying to access information uh, and earn a little bit of money one way or another um, from those organisations that don't quite have their cybersecurity up to scratch. So there's some real challenges for us as uh, staff in nonprofit organisations in terms of what we do. You'll see here it's it's not something that's a commercial organisation only. We've got Oxfam, we've got Uniting Care. Uh, bottom right was another large not-for-profit uh, here in Melbourne, uh, which is where I'm joining from. And, and government is also taking it more seriously. There's legislation before parliament to lift the maximum fine for serious or repeated breaches of the Privacy Act from 2.2 to $50 million. So people are taking it more seriously. The key challenge though, and this is why I'm so excited by everyone on the call today, is that the human element continues to drive breaches. Um, and more and more making sure that everyone knows how to keep information safe and how to protect um, the information within your organisation. If we could just jump to the next slide, Anne, um, is really critical. From a recent global breach investigation report, about four out of every five involved the human element. So one of the things I say is it's not just enough to have great cybersecurity technology protections. Yes, you need to make sure you've got technology protections in place and we run a monthly webinar to help teach your IT managers about that. 
it's also really important that everyone takes it seriously and thinks about it. Um, I spent a number of years working in, in the law enforcement sector for police forces around the country, and we used to have breaches where people would leave this is paper on a desk and someone would walk in and swipe the paper. So that's all about the human side. That's all about treating information securely, making sure you don't leave those laptops in the car uh, unattended when you walk away. And, and because security behavior is greatly influenced by everyone in your organization and your perception of risk. And what we want to do is give you the key skills and help you to think about what is risky versus not risky and then pay appropriate attention to that as well. Thanks, Anne. So. We, I said we were going to talk about five things. The first one and, and is from my perspective, how most uh, breaches start, if you like, uh, and that is the phishing emails. Now, I'm sure you don't just get spam phishing emails with dodgy links. If, if you know, everyone I speak to these days gets phone calls with people trying to get credit card numbers, they get texts, you name it, it comes in every manner, shape and form. But this guide here will give you the core information irrespective of, of you know, whether it's a, a text or an email. And in organisations, it's still email is the number one way that, that hackers are getting in as that starting point. It's not the only way, it's still the most prevalent way in our experience around the nonprofits we've worked with. So seven tips we recommend you look for. Number one, a strange from address. So for instance, in the example on the screen, you can see there's a uh, there's a reply to address john at moneybank.com from tax refunds at ATO gov without uh, the, the right wording in there. So all of a sudden there's a little uh, alarm bell that should be going off. The from and the you know the, the from address has an ATO gov.com. There's no .au, there's no full stop, so there's some strange things in there. Um, number two, as you can see here um, on the on the right hand side of the screen, the reply to address is different from the from address. That's another little trigger point. Number three, poor spelling, grammar or design, because these are often put together rather quickly, often without an appropriate level of due care. Um, you can see that there's some you know grammar issues throughout um, and, and and you'll see in the in the next one there's also some challenges around um, you know are fonts and those sorts of things appropriate to, to an Australian government element. Um, number four attachments you didn't ask for. So for instance in this uh, option there's a tax refund.pdf.exe don't open them. Number five, a generic greeting. Usually the ATO would understand your name um, and they would uh, say dear Marcus or dear Anne. In this case, that's just said dear taxpayer. Again, that's just about, that's the number, that's the fifth key thing that we suggest you look for. Number six, urgent calls to action. Deadline for refunds is Friday. You've got to do it straight away. And number seven, this is the one we also always suggest, hover over any link to see where it goes. Um, it, it, there's no risk hovering over, so long as you don't click on it. Does the address look right? Does it look dodgy? So there, if you like, the seven ways that we teach people, and this is a great slide from an organization called Hivent, um, that, that if you think about these when you're reading one an email that might be dodgy, um, 99 times out of 100, if you work through these questions, you'll be able to work it out yourself. So looking at the first example that I'll talk through, this is a real life one, um, and, and I'll talk this through. So can you spot it? For example, <coughs> here we have, you know, a, the Australian government agency emblem, it says. Well, that's a bit weird. Why would they be telling us that it's an emblem? So there's some strange grammar that's not making any sense there, um, which is the first indication that it's a phishing email. You can see also on the first main line of text, um, you've got different font sizes. Subsidy benefit allocation is different from the rest of it. Uh, there's no dear Marcus. So we are writing is the first sentence. Um, so that's the uh, another indication again that it's a phishing email. Um, as well as 
the fact that it's asking you to enter your date of birth, your tax file number, your address and your name um, in, a, in, in a reply email. That's another indication because you would never, or the Australian government would never ask for those details to be sent by email. Email is not a secure way of sending information. So there's five different triggers um, that all work together in terms of what might be going on in terms of that, it's a phishing email. If you jump to the next one, yep, and you'll see here's another example. Um, this is, and again, pretend that you, pretend you're a taxpayer in the last one, pretend you're a good to give giver in this one. Um, this is a legitimate email, all right? And there's a few triggers inside that, but this is, you know, we also get uh, password reset examples uh, that often are phishing attempts as well. But for instance, here, if you look up the top, the workplace giving is, is you know, the good to give is the same both in the reply to as the um, as the to address. It's personalised, dear Jane. So it's not uh, it's not dear sir slash ma'am. Um, you if you hover over the reset password again, it's giving a sensible URL. It's not something dodgy like https slash hack me please. Um, and so that's a third indication that it's good. So from our indications, this is a reasonable um, request and can always be uh, clicked on. We always suggest where you're uncertain, either talk to your IT team or pick up the phone and call the organisation that is uh, sending you those emails and just say, hey, I received this. Is it dodgy? I wasn't quite sure. That's another way. Don't call the phone number in the email. Get the phone number via some public, either a website or let's say out of the yellow pages. I'm showing my age there. Um, because often what all phishing uh, individuals will do is they will change the phone numbers to go to their call centers. So that's just a little extra tip there. All right. Now a question for you, if you spot at Coles, if you shop at Coles, sorry, um, and you get this email, do you think it's a phishing email or a legitimate email? And Anne will pop up the question in a quiz. Thanks, Anne. Um, so is this a phishing email or a legitimate email is the question that we're asking here. Um, you're a coal shopper, many people are, um, so is it, there's a good chance. I'll just give you a, a minute or so to pick either click and enter my details or delete. Getting some nice results there. People have been listening or you're all a lot better than most of the nonprofit staff I work with on a regular basis because uh, we've got 100% on delete. Um, the reasons for that, it's the dodgy URL down the bottom. Uh, it's got nothing to do with Coles. So that's the first reason. Uh, second reason is the, the fact that um, the fact that it's not personalized um, and <clears throat> it's it's an urgent call to action around hurry up. We're giving 25 cards worth $50 each. So there's some real triggers there um, around around what's going on. I have got the question in the past. Well, it's coming from Coles.com. Is that real? Is it not? Um, can you spoof? You know, if it looks like it's coming from Coles, could it be real? Is it always therefore real? And the answer is uh, the same as you know, hackers can pretend to, to arrive from any email address. So that's the little trick there. There is some things you can do to reduce their ability to do that, but for many organizations, that's possible to do for anything. All right, Anne, would you mind just talking through some extra tips around phishing and, uh, and our other four big tips? Thank you, Marcus, and thank you everyone for joining me today. Um, I'll, I'll equip you with some extra tips to stay safe online. Um, so the first one is if you work with a lot of money or you work with a lot of um, sensitive details in your 
organisation, you need to be extra, extra careful, especially those information related to payrolls, accounts, managers with financials, data. Um, these individuals will have financial authorities and the finance teams um, that are very prone to um, cyber attack. Earlier this month, um, the accountant at, my, at Info Exchange, my organizations, just talked to me that, oh, I received this email from you asking for to change to a new bank account. Is that actually you? And they said, oh, definitely not. I'm still using the same one. So, um, yeah, those people want, wanting to um, get illegal access to your account are that close. Um, so don't trust emails with BSB and account details. If you want to reconfirm, feel free to verify the information by speaking with the individual or staff or supplier. As Marcus mentions, use verify phone number, public phone number that are verified on their websites or um, a source that you can trust, like ACNC, for example, not the number listed in the email. The next very good tip is to is you need to um, protect your information and sensitive information bef even before they are getting attacked. The law requires you to take reasonable measures to protect sensitive information. A number of data breaches happen just due to human error, as we hear in earlier statistics and in Marcus um, has told us about the user case. So please, um, you need to store and tell your people, your staff to store information securely. Um, most organizations require sensitive data to be stored in certain locations, especially health organizations in Australia, for example, that even require the data to be stored in, the, um, in Australia, not in any other countries. So, for example, with client data in your client and case management system or staff data in your HR system, those must be protected and stored in a secure, restricted area, not an area that can be accessed by everyone or all staff at your company. If within your organisations you collect information, consider confidentials um, by certain industry standards or by laws, you must take further measures to protect it. Um, these measures for personal information might be, you only collect the information you need for a particular purpose, you do not connect, collect extra one, and you must ensure that those sensitive data, such as client records for nonprofits who may serve, um, serve as healthcare service or um, mental health service, for example, should only be stored in certain locations, for example, in client or case measurement system, not in a random Excel file that you just stored without being protected by anything on your computer. That is not safe for your client data. And of course, if we talk about cybersecurity, we talk about good password practices as well. I always emphasize, I cannot emphasize enough with my client that you must turn on multi-factor authentications. Nowadays, multi-factor authentication is more and more common when you access government um, account or bank account. Um, the practice of using password and another factor to log in into a user account, such as a text message or an authenticated app on your phone, make it so much safer and it's um, help the um, organizations um, stay safe especially when more and more of us are moving into the cloud space. When we, when the staff work from home more, they need remote access. Um, so we move into the cloud for better collaboration. But at the same time, you need to turn on multi-factor authentication to be safer online. And 
please do not share password or use password between accounts. So a very common case is um, we usually use the same password for our personal email and a work email or use the same set of password for, for different account register for different apps. And it's just not safe at all because um, for example, if your Optus account just got breached, um, that password might be prone to, and, and you use the same password of that Optus account with other applications or other software as well, then it's you're prone to getting attacked when that password is revealed. So please do not just randomly share password and reuse password. And please, um, you can use a good password manager if you don't want that to happen. Um, with password manager, it helps you generate and securely record your password. So um, you know how you can pick a strong password um, and you do not have to reuse those passwords all the time. Um, if you have good memories, um, I will not, um, yeah, I will not stop you from 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 memorizing all those passwords yourself um, but just be careful make strong password and um, stay safe the fourth tip i want to tell you is you need to keep your device secure um, physically protect it when you travel and carry your device um, don't just randomly leave your laptop on your car or um, or if when you are um, going work or, or you will work remotely or on site, just don't, just don't keep your um, laptop unlocked or your phone unlocked. Please lock your screen when device is left unattended. Um, with Windows, you can use Control Alt Del. With Mac, use Control um, Command and Q. Um, lock your screen so pe other people cannot just access your information, your data or your sensitive data on your laptop or your phone. Please feel free to um, update, keep your device up to date, patch your devices, laptop, mobile frequently. Um, so um, you've got the latest version of your app. Um, you stay safe with those most up to date versions. When we will start working from home and then um, our children are also studying from home as well, um, sometimes the kids use the parents' devices um, and they might install some unauthorized software or some um, games that they might find online. So um, be careful of that. Please don't install unauthorized software on organization devices. Um, even, yeah, they do not, um, hack or they do not just get access to your account, they might, they might um, yeah, record your, your data um, when you type that in. Or, um, for example, recently, um, our organizations um, sent out emails that, oh, you should, might, you might be more careful when you, when you use um, Grammarly on um, organizational computer because um, that they might keep a record of whichever text or whichever article you put in there um, for grammar check. So be careful with that. And please don't ignore warnings and error. Warnings and error are born for a reason. It gives you um, some warnings of what you, what you should do and then you should take actions to resolve the warnings and errors. If you're using your own device, um, and it's very common in the nonprofit space, such as mobile phone or other laptop device for work within organizations, there are a few things that um, you need to take care of. Firstly, you only store the information of your organizations. Um, yeah, and then uh, if your organizations is comfortable for you to store it on your personal device, make sure you follow the organization policies and procedures. You need to ensure that your device has appropriate security controls such as PIN, passcode, fingerprints to unlock, update and patch your uh, computer so it got the latest security updates and um, enable remote wipe capability. The last tips I would like to give is 
make sure you report anything you are not sure about. Um, security incident at first event, which pose a threat to organization information system and services, and they can stem from a variety of sources. So ensure that in your organization, you know who you should report to present when potential security incidents happens. Um, if your organization has an IT provider, make sure you have the key contact. Um, if your organizations um, manage your own IT environment, make sure you have an, a tech champion or um, someone that you can come to when you um, catch a phishing email or when you found something fishy on your devices. Make sure you report anything you're worried about and fami unfamiliar activity, disclosure of information to unauthorized person. If you lost your device, make sure you report that to the right person as well. And um, an escorted person on office premise acting suspiciously as well. Um, now we need to guide not only physical asset, but also um, data, information about our clients. Those are also our set of organization as well. Um, and you can see on the screen right now, um, the Australian Cybersecurity Centre National Cybersecurity Hotline. You can reach that if you need um, urgent help. So key takeaways. First and foremost, most important takeaways is use a strong, unique passwords. Um, Next one, beware of phishing emails. You all the tips that Marcus gave us in that very useful poster to identify the, the right email, um, which one is a phishing one you need to delete and then no longer care about which one is the legit one. Um, and remember that Froster will create website, send text, call you, the lie, the mimic, or the um, supplier, the banks, in order to capture information. Um, very frequently recently, um, I received a leaflet from a bank saying that no one would ask for, um, we just go and ask for your personal details, such as your ID number, um, your home address, your bank account, your password. Those are very fishy. So stay aware. Um, if you are not sure, call the verified number. Um, public listed one, not the one that they gave you in email or the letter or text they sent you. Use multi-factor authentication on all accounts that are important to you and on critical IT systems, especially when you use cloud any cloud platform such as Office 365 or um, Google Workspace. Keep your device secure um, physically and on cyberspace. Know your IT and security policies provided by your organizations and especially um, when you work with your own device, know who you should report to when something suspicious happens. So in this next slide, um, we attach some useful resources that you can refer to, some guides um, on our hub um, for some essential cybersecurity help. Um, book a consultant with us if you need further help, and then a whole lot of other tools from the government so you can learn more about cybersecurity and stay safe online. Um, so now I'll hand back to Marcus for questions and discussions. Thanks, Anne. Apologies for running slightly over. There was just too much to cover today. First of all, um, if anyone has any questions, please come off mute, ask away. Um, we've also got a very quick three question, 60 second survey, which we would love your feedback on. There's a link up the top. There's also a short link in the chat that you can easily click on as well. Um, <clears throat> so if does anyone have any questions that they would like to cover anything that you're worried about anything that you want to know yes it's belinda i have a question hey um, belinda absolutely uh, uh, just in relation to the advice to update our devices i use a macbook that has the monterey uh, operating system on it and of course there's an alert saying that i can update to ventura 
But I've also read advice saying if you're happy with your current operating system and it's fairly recent, then there's no need to upgrade. So I'm not quite sure what to do. And my answer would be, uh, I would just hold where you are if you're happy with it at the moment and there's nothing you specifically need in the new uh, you know, Ventura uh, option. For, as another example, I'm on Windows. I'm still running Windows 10. I'm not running Windows 11. Um, and that's as much because they'll iron bugs out in the new versions and the longer you wait the more it's the, the, the you know more stable it will be with less problems so i i would suggest if there's no reason to move hold at some stage you will need to move but right. you know you, you'll get plenty of warning about that okay will they still do updates to monterey now that ventura is available yes they do updates for a fair period of time okay. i'm not sure of the exact but you'll also get notified when they're going to stop pause the updates Right, thank you. Uh, and Carolyn has a question. Do you have any recommendations for secure password managers um, and customer management systems? So, I'll, and if you could just flick through two slides, um, two further slides forward. Password managers, um, oh, one back. Yeah. Uh, password managers while the screen comes screen. back up. Um, for individuals, I like both LastPath and Dashlane because they've got really solid free options for organizations. So if you're looking for it for your whole organization, Carolyn, um, what you you might want to consider Dashlane just because there's a non-profit discount available on that. Whereas I don't think either last pass, I don't think last pass or one password is the other one which I've heard of a bit and is quite good. That's it, neither of them have non-profit discounts. So that would be what I would suggest. Um, Secure customer management systems. Most customer management systems are fairly secure. Um, it all comes down to what sort of services you provide. The hardest thing from our perspective uh, is finding a good customer management system that suits your organization. Um, and 99, no, I'll say 98 of them are secure. So that's the, the farthest bit with customer management is, is finding that. So I hope that helps, Carolyn. If not, just come off mute or ask again. Um, I saw a hand up, Laura. Hi, um, how often would you recommend changing passwords for like your company's accounts? So, you know, we've got Facebook and Canva and, um, you know, our banking and Instagram and try booking and this and that. Um, so not really, I know you should probably change it at some stage, but how often? Great question. And because the advice has actually changed over the last few years. Um, <clears throat> so I'll say what we what we recommend is that your accounts should all be secured using multi-factor authentication. So everything, I'm sure that's the case with your bank, for instance, um, but it may not, you may not have enabled it, you know, in your Facebook account or something like that. Um, and so the first comment is everything should be uh, secured so that you get either a text or an alert on a, on your phone or some other thing. Um, and if that's enabled, Microsoft's recommendation, and to be honest, I agree with them, don't change your passwords. What And the reason for that is what they found was that most people if you're forcing people to change passwords, they'll do one of two things because they struggle to remember them. They will either put numbers on the end of it and just ratchet up the number every month or year or week or however often, which means you're not really changing your password at all. Um, or they'll, you'll change all your passwords on all your accounts at exactly the same time to exactly the same password. And again, that's less secure as well. So our recommendation is have multi-factor authentication and don't change, don't force password changes. Um, if some organizations are unhappy with that and I go, well, what what are you happy with? Is it six months? Is it 12 months? You know, is it one month? And how are you helping your staff? Is it a password manager or something else um, to make sure that um, they use separate passwords everywhere. So that, that would be our recommendation. Um, the only other comment, oh, I had another comment, but it's just popped out of my head. So that'll do for now. I hope that helps, Laura. It does. Thank you. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Yes. 
Yeah, I have a question regarding um, security keys like a UV key. Are these a good tools to use? Uh, yes, is my short answer. Um, <clears throat> so security keys are a good uh, a good tool to use, and we would recommend that. Um, but we we would also say that it needs to be put in place. You know that that together with other protections is what's important. Um, beautiful. Any last minute questions? Please take our survey. You can do it while I've been talking. If uh, there's the link in there. Uh, if you've got no other questions, but otherwise, I will thank you for another wonderful lunch and learn question uh, session. We always love your questions. Um, and yes, stay safe, look after all your wonderful information and keep doing the services and the wonderful role you play in your community. So thank you so much for all your time. Thank you. I, I, I ask, are these a regular series of sessions? Uh, we actually run the same session every month. Um, and the reason why is we've found there's a lot of there's always new staff and and we used to say for about a year um, everyone should train all their staff and everyone nodded and then didn't do anything so we just <laughs> thought we're just going to run it every month same basic information non-profits around Australia and New Zealand can send their staff to these for free and that was the whole concept wonderful wonderful there thank you, you. Your questionnaire hasn't come up, by the way. Oh, no, it, there was a link. Let me just paste another link in. Um, if not, and we'll, we'll also make sure, so there's a link at the bottom of the chat. Um, otherwise, if that link's not working or you can't see it, it will. there will be a link in the email you get with the uh, recording in the slide pack. Thank you very much. Beautiful. No problems at all. Thanks, Belinda. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.